My name's Tristan Scroggins, and today we're going to be talking about Molly and Tim Brooks, a classic bluegrass song, and we're going to be uh, figuring out how to play it on the mandolin. Molly and Tim Brooks is a pretty interesting song if you're into history, I guess, bluegrass history. It's based on an actual historical race that took place in 1878 between a horse named Tim Brook and another one named Molly, um, spelled like very differently from how we spell it in the song title. It's an old song. It's been around since the 1800s, but significantly to bluegrass, it was recorded by Bill Monroe in 1947. It didn't end up being released until 1949. In the meantime, the Stanley brothers, who were big fans, Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, had heard Bill play Molly and Timbrook somewhere, maybe on the Opry or something, and they started covering the song and ended up recording their own version, which actually came out in 1948. If I'm remembering, they maybe didn't realize that he hadn't actually put out the recording yet. So it's both significant in that they accidentally put out the song before Bill did, and it's also the first like notable cover of a bluegrass song, like in a bluegrass style, um, like somebody covering Bill Monroe in that very specific way. So it's it's a kind of significant recording in terms of the evolution of what we now refer to as bluegrass. But we're going to talk specifically about uh, a soil that Doyle Lawson takes on an album called the Bluegrass Album. Um, you might hear people talk about the Bluegrass Album Band, things like that. The Bluegrass Album Band was formed in 1980. Uh, it was originally, Tony Rice was just putting out a solo project, uh, but this band ended up becoming very popular, and the album that they put out, the Bluegrass Album, ended up having a bunch of different volumes. I think there were five volumes altogether. The first album featured uh, Tony Rice, J.D. Crow, Dole Lawson, Bobby Hicks and uh, Todd Phillips, and it's become a real, I mean, become it was put out more than 40 years ago. It's a real classic album. It's interesting because it's covers of these, like, first-generation artists, like Bill Monroe and stuff, um, but the popularity of these recordings have often led to people learning these specific versions and then not learning the older versions, and then, but that's a whole different video about how these songs evolve and stuff. We're just going to talk about Dole's solo. Dole's, Dole's solo. We're going to talk about Dole's solo. It's not Doyle Lawson, it's Dole Lawson. It's really hard to say Dole and solo right next to each other. But we're going to talk about his solo on this song. It's in the key of B flats. We can talk about playing in that closed position, and uh, it's just a classic. Before we get into it, uh, I'm going to play it slow for you, and then we'll break it down piece by piece. Two, three, four. So we're playing in the key of B flat. So we're going to be playing mostly out of this one position. We move a little bit, but let's figure out that position and sort of get a home base for our fingers to rest in. So we're going to start by taking our index finger and we're going to put it on the root note. So the key of B flat, that would be B flat. And we're going to put it on the first fret of the A string. It's a B flat note. And then we're going to take our middle finger and place it on the third fret of the D string. This is an F note, and so this, these two notes together, they make a double stop that you could play over B flat. Um, you can play it over lots of different things, but for right now, it's a B flat. To make it a little bit easier, we've talked about this pattern before in other videos, so I'm just gonna go over it really quick. We have this, it's like a modified pentatonic scale <laughs> that uh, I sort of use to show where most of these notes are going to be. It sounds like this.
So it's just kind of a scale with a few notes taken away and a few added. But all that is, is that's where most of the notes that we're going to be playing live. So we're going to start with this double stop like we had in this home position. And we're going to play third fret, fifth fret, first fret. And then third fret again. And then this time we're going to use our ring finger to play the fourth fret. This little chromatic thing. And then we're going to go up, use our ring finger to play the fifth fret. So three, five, one, three, four, five. And then we're going to keep going. We're going to move our index finger to the first fret of the E string now. And we're going to play this third fret of the E string. And we're going to play the fourth fret of the E string. And that dissonance, that's a flat seven note or dominant seven. And then we're going to use our pinky, play the sixth fret of the E string which is also a B-flat note. So the same note as this first fret on the A string, sixth fret of the E string. So again, on the E string, that was first fret, third fret, fourth fret, sixth fret. When you combine that with the first bit, we get... I'll say the fret, uh, the fret numbers, Remember, we're starting on the D string and then moving up to the E string. So we have three, five, one, three, four, five, one, three, four, six. And if we said the note names, we would have F, G, B flat, C, uh, D flat, D, F, <laughs> G, A flat, B flat. And so you can practice, I mean, this this is a great exercise, no matter what, you can practice going up, and then you can go back down. When we go back down, one thing I'll point out is just that I like to, when we were going up, we used our ring finger here, ring finger on the fourth fret to the fifth fret. When we go back down, I like using my middle finger on that fourth fret to the third fret, back to the first fret. It just adds a little bit more, um, it, I want to say continuity, I don't think that's exactly the right word, but it just um, makes that flow a little bit better. So, now that we know where uh, most of the notes are going to be, let's start playing the melody. This is an interesting way, I think, to interpret the melody. One of the things that I like about uh, showing these solos is the different ways that different people express melodies on the mandolin in a way that makes them sound like bluegrass. I think one of the main things that I see when teaching is people trying to make things sound more like bluegrass mandolin instead of just mandolin playing over bluegrass, if that makes sense. I think that this song has a very particular way that it chooses to express the melody. And bluegrass songs, I mean, they're sung melodies for the most part. And the voice, both by the nature of you being able to hold out a note for a long time, and the fact that you have to breathe <laughs> puts a lot of space in between melodies that are sung. But the mandolin doesn't have a lot of sustain to it. Once you play a note, it will kind of ring, but not when it's like up to this speed. You can't really ring and create that kind of feeling that you can by playing the violin or singing or anything like that. So there's different ways that we compensate for that. Things that we've talked about in the past often use tremolo and double stops to fill in that space, like... But this solo uses a lot more eighth notes rather than those sort of held out phrases, but in a way that doesn't feel like it's just a bunch of random notes all the time. I feel like, certainly when I was trying to learn how to put together solos and to play bluegrass, I was just kind of playing a bunch of random notes all the time. So we can sort of see how we can put it together in a way that makes sense. So we're going to start in our uh, home position, uh, index finger on that first fret of the A string, middle finger, third fret of the D string. And our first note's actually going to be that third fret of the D string, but we're sliding into it. And it's not a big slide, it's just a grace note slide, meaning that instead of really emphasizing this second fret before we slide into it, it's just happening 
it's almost as if the pick is hitting the string right at the very end of a slide happening. Whereas if I played at the beginning of a slide, like you would hear the first note all the way going into the second note. Uh, in this case, we're just getting the very end. Real quick movement. So, and pay attention here to the rhythms. Uh, you can't really, Tab isn't very good at showing um, rhythmic subtleties, but you can see in the sheet music, the staff, these are staccato notes. They're supposed to be, this first one is held out normal, but then these next two, we mute those, we cut them short a little bit. We do that by the same way that when we do a chop chord, we just stop pressing down. We can do that with these notes too by letting that first one ring as long as we want. Uh, but then these next ones, we just stop pushing down and we get a shorter note. And that just gives this a little bit more bounce and a little bit more feeling and shows some contrast. So we got that and then we have, so index finger, open index finger, middle finger, index finger. So let's talk about what the melody is really quick. If you kind of really simplified the melody, you would get run old Molly run, run old Molly run. Really just two notes, B flat and F. So how are we going to make that <laughs> something more and still have it be the melody? Well, we can do something, we've sort of talked about this before, of circling a note, like playing the notes um, in the scale right before and after it. And if with this melody note, instead of going run on, we can go. And all that is is playing that uh, first note open, so going one step behind it, back to it, and then going one step further, so the third fret here, and then going back to the root. Even though those are like a bunch of different notes, in this quick succession, it still is conveying the same information as, and we can add a bounce to it that really is sort of selling uh, what this rhythm is supposed to be. And then we're going to go up to this F note, and we're going to do that by going. So let's play it together. Three, four. Let's try it again. Three, four. So we're gonna let that ring out for the rest of that measure and then go into the next little bit of melody. So the melody simplified again would be run old Molly run, run old Molly run. So we're gonna do a pretty similar thing with this note he, here, this G note, by playing notes before and after in the scale. We're gonna approach it from the note before it, so this F note, the first fret of the E string, so we're going to start by going, and then we're going to play of this G note. And then we're going to jump up to this B flat, uh, which in this position, I'm going to use my pinky to play that sixth fret of the E string. And then we're going to go back down to this G, and then now we're passing to get to this Ultimately, we're going to get to this sixth fret on the A string, this E flat note. So now we're just sort of walking. Six, three, one, six. So that whole measure is. And we'll play it together, but first let's just look at the rest of this E flat measure because all it is is we're filling in space there. The melody ends right there on that. So we need to fill in this measure just because that's a long time to not really be doing anything. All we're going to do is play a double stop. In this case, keep our pinky on the sixth fret of the A string. And our middle finger is going to go, well, it's going to kind of stay on the third fret of the E string. We had just played that, and so we're going to 
play it as a double stop and it's gonna sound like one two and three four so that whole measure all together is let's play that one time together and then add the first part three four Yeah, so let's include the kickoff, so it's going to sound like... Yeah, so let's do it all together, so we'll do it a, a little bit slower than that. So. And remember, we're coming in on the second beat, so I'm going to go four, one, and then we're going to start. Three, four, one... One more time. Three, four, one. Great. You know, one of the fun things about teaching is seeing things that you didn't even realize that you were doing uh, or just stumbling on these little things. Uh, when I was playing that, I realized that one of the things that I feel like helps make that what it is, is you probably caught me playing that very first pickup note just a little bit early when I counted three, four, one. Like I really came in in front of where that note was supposed to be. And that anticipation is really built into the feeling of a lot of these bluegrass songs. It's this feeling, it's really hard to capture where there is a confidence to it, so it's sort of laid back, it's not very frantic, but it is really insistent and really excited. And so you have these things where you're sort of rushing out in front of something, the feeling is of insistence. So after uh, what we just did, we have a pretty similar sort of uh, next little bit in fact, this next measure is almost completely the same as a measure we just played. Uh, the one we played leading into that E flat note, or that E flat chord rather, was. And notice that sound of us going down towards this E flat note. It's almost exactly the same now, but we're not going to do that um, motion towards something else. We're going to go. So we're doing third fret, sixth fret, middle finger, pinky twice. So we have first fret, third fret, and then three, six, three, six. Just a little bit different than the first time, but almost exactly the same. Let's try together. Three, four. One more time, three, four. Yeah, isolated, it sounds a little bit weird. Um, it's because we're uh, going back into a B flat and where the melody is sort of taking us, it makes sense for us to not really, we're not pushing it in a particular direction. We're just gonna stay right here and the, we're gonna play. So now is the first time we're really getting like a blue. I always feel super awkward saying blue note. Um, I think just because it obviously like conjures up an image of like Miles Davis or something like that. And for as much as bluegrass has in common with jazz, it's very funny to say that this thick is like akin to like a Miles Davis kind of thing. I know that that's not what it is, but that's just what my brain does. But we have this first blue note which is this fourth fret of the a string which remember when we did our little position thing that little fourth fret on the a string was in there and in fact oops it was going into this fifth fret and that's exactly what we're about to do this fourth fret or d flat is 
we would call it the minor third because if we made a B flat major chord, we'd have B flat, D, and E flat. Oop, that's not right. We'd have B flat, D, and F. Those are the notes in a B flat major chord. So if we took that D note and we flattened it into a D flat, then we would have a B minor chord. B flat, D flat, F. So we call that the minor third. Um, it's very common in bluegrass to play around with the minor third, switching to the major third, um, as well as sometimes the flat five going to the major five, um, and a lot of dominant seven or flat seven. You don't need to know any of those words. It's not really important. It's just in case you were wondering that's what it is. But well, that's all that it really is. And you hear that sound a lot. in this kind of music. So this lick, um, it also kind of doesn't make sense as just a single measure. So when we put it with the one before, it makes a little bit more sense, but it's part of a longer phrase. I think that that's one thing when you look at like books of licks and things like that, it's really easy for people to like cut off like where something was going and why it was contextual. Like you can certainly play as a lick in a lot of different songs in a lot of different places, but in the context of what Doyle's doing here, it's related to um, the neck, the previous and the next measure. So that next measure is flat third to major third. So we're going to be using our uh, ring finger on that fourth fret, up to the fifth fret, back to the first fret, fifth fret, third fret, first fret, open, third fret, first fret. That's a whole lot. Um, essentially all that's happening is this is just like a little, that major third, minor third lick. And then we're doing another of that, like circle, circling the train of the of this note that we're going to, which is this B flat note. We're going to the end of the melody here and back to the root note. And so we're going. So we're playing the note uh, after the root note, which is um, the C note in this case, third fret, down to the root note, one past it, behind it, whatever, however you want to say it, uh, this A note and then back jumping over it back to that C note, and then finally landing on that root note, kind of like circling the drain. So we have this little minor third, major third, and then circling the drain. When we combine that with the previous measure, we get So you see that B flat measure in there, that middle measure is really the way that I hear it at least. It's almost like a preface to this. It's just kind of, they're really tied together in how they work. Let's play those three measures together so we make sure we, we've got it. So uh, just as a reminder, it sounds like And a quick note, we're doing something very similar on this B flat measure. We're just gonna play three B flat notes in a row on their quarter notes, so they're on uh, numbered beats, so they're downstrokes. And you'll see in the second one, there's a ghost note written of this open D string. Uh, it's because Doral plays that, but it's almost definitely like a mistake, or not even a mistake, but just like, you know, it's pretty easy to brush up against that string. Doesn't sound bad or anything, it just is in there. I'm just pointing it out this way to say that it's not super important that you try to hit that note. It just is there if you want to. So let's try measure five, three, or well, so we're actually coming in on the one this time, so two, 
three, four. Yeah, one more time. Three, four. So this is the end of the melody now, essentially. So at this point, we've played like two thirds of the melody. But if you sort of look at how the verse is constructed, run on Molly, run, run on Molly, run. Tim Brooks gonna beat you. Uh, you can't see because of all the lights. It is um, three in the morning when I'm <laughs> making this video. So I don't really want to screech out at the very top of my range. <laughs> but we got run on Molly, run. Run on Molly, run. Tim Brooks gonna beat you in the bright morning sun. That's like the chunk, the like the meat of the verse. Then we're just kind of repeating that last line. The bright morning sun, oh Lord, in the bright morning sun. When we turn that into a mandolin solo, we've, you know, more or less followed that melody. Run on Molly, run. Run on Molly, run. Now that we've got to kind of the end of that meteor melody part, bright morning sun, we can kind of do something a little bit different now. I think that a good rule of thumb in general when approaching creating solos, playing solos, things like that. In this context, it's a good idea to start out with the melody and go somewhere from there. If you just start out playing a bunch of random stuff, it's going to be kind of hard to sell as the song, like theoretically, I should be able to hear just the middle of your solo and know what song that you're playing. Uh, but in a case like this, especially where we've really defined the melody and we just have these measures that are repeating parts of the melody from before, we can kind of just go off book, which is what Doral does here. We um, start doing a lot. We were moving across the fretboard a lot more and we're playing a lot more of these blue notes sort of just and more just like licks and things like that. So let's look at what's happening. So we just finished with very exciting. So now the next bit here, we have these two pickup notes, first fret, fifth fret. And then we're gonna just kind of go through, it's all of the notes of uh, that thing that we learned in the beginning but now we're kind of going a little lower. We're going to go into the G string, and then we're going to go back up um, and just sort of play across the fretboard. So we have. And it's kind of one long idea. It just all strings into each other. But let's try to break it down a little bit. So the first two measures there are... are Let's go up to there. So we have, now we're gonna go third fret, fifth fret, open. And now we're gonna move over to the G string and do fifth fret, third fret, fifth fret, and then back over to the D string, open third fret. If you're holding the, the neck of the mandolin properly, if you're using your proper left hand technique, when you switch over, to playing these notes on the G string, a lot of times what I see people do is stick out their wrist like this because they're trying to get their fingers to reach over all the way to the G string. But that, what's happening when you do that is you're pulling your thumb behind the neck, which is putting a lot of stress on your thumb anyway. But obviously this is putting a lot of stress on your wrist and you don't want that. And also it's just not a very good, it's hard to get leverage because remember, we're always trying to use the tips of our fingers and you don't really have good leverage when you are like, there's not really any force holding uh, the mandolin there. So what we can do, and again, forgive my, if this is not <laughs> the right chair for this, is you can change where your elbow is in relation to like your body, be closer or further away. And this is over dramatized, but it's sort of then your index finger is acting as sort of a pivot on the strings. And what that means is that if you're just in this regular, 
If you move your elbow further away from your body and you keep your wrist straight, it kind of rotates your hand in this direction where these fingers are a little bit more out here. And you can use that to play. I do that when I play shapes like this um, weird like D7 chord because then my hand is kind of naturally at this angle that accommodates that versus if I pull my elbow closer to my body, then my hand kind of does the opposite where it's more like the angle you would need to play this G chop chord. And so you can, you can rotate and you can do it without moving your whole wrist. You can just rotate your wrist like independently of your elbow. All that to say that when you're doing this, I don't want you to put your elbow or your wrist out like this trying to get those notes. You can think about pivoting and it'll be a lot more comfortable and a lot more sustainable in the long run. So um, that was a long little bit about proper technique, but we have. Let's play that together. So those pick of notes are on the four and I'm gonna count one and two and three and we're gonna come in on that four. So one and two and three and. Yeah, again, three, uh, one and two and three and. Yeah, so we have, and then we're gonna keep going, uh, first fret, third fret, sixth fret. So those were almost all notes again from our little pattern from before, we're just adding that open A. And again, this measure just sort of isolated, doesn't really, you know, it sounds cool, but it doesn't really just this measure sound like anything. In fact, that first little bit sounds like it could be a completely different something in G minor. <laughs> but we're just going. So those two measures together. Just this really long string of notes. Let's do that a couple times. Two, uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. A real workout for the right hand being really consistent. This is a, a place to really notice your uh, stamina with the right hand, not of like playing super fast or anything, but being able to play that string of eighth notes really consistently without starting to speed up or slow down anywhere in there. Let's try it again. One, two, three. So then we get to this next measure. So we got. So we have. Kind of a stretch if you're not used to it, but three, one, six, one. And then we're gonna play a slide from that fourth fret into the fifth fret. And this is a full slide, like a full proper um, long slide, not that short one from the beginning. And then we're going to play that first fret, fifth fret, down to this, the fifth fret on the D string. Let's play those uh, previous measures with this. So we have one, two, three. Again, one, two, three. One more time, one, two, three. Great. Um, and now we have one little last bit here, plus a little bit extra, but this last bit we have, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, if you're not comfortable with the pinky so much, this is a really easy place to do that shift. If you really wanted to, again, I recommend trying to do the pinky, but we're going to go. So 3, 1, 6, A string into the D string. And we're going to cut that note short. And then, which is, um, this song is so major, it's very funny to have like such a minor sounding thing. So we have 6th fret, 3rd fret open D and then the 6th fret of the G string and then 3rd uh, fret of the G string just that measure 3, 4 one more time 3, 4 yeah uh, if it sounds kind of random it's because it uh, kind of is like I said we're just doing a bunch of licks here at the end, doing a little bit of showing off. So all of that section together is... So from that whole little section we have uh, one, two, three. time one two three yeah and we have a little bit extra here um this is a common thing and i feel like it's most common with the mandolin i've never really like it's more anecdotal at this point i've never really like gone and tried to see if it's actually true but this like playing for like a number of extra solos after or not solos another extra measures after your solo like you hear other instruments do it a lot but a lot of times like you hear it on this album a lot of bobby hicks like kind of just keeps playing after his solo but in a way where like it's kind of fading out as the vocals are coming back in um mandolin solos often have this like little extra bit at the end of just, again, more licks and stuff. Um, but they just kind of let it happen. I don't know. It's kind of a strange thing. It's uh, If you start to listen for it, I think the most obvious is whenever um, you get something like... Some version of just, like, doing that arpeggio, like, up and down. Um, I you, it's just hear that a lot for some reason. And we have that here, but it's not just this arpeggio thing. It's more of the same kind of lick that we've been doing. So uh, I'll play the whole thing. I will say we're immediately shifting positions. So far, we've been in first position, meaning that our fingers are pretty much playing the frets that you would expect them to play. A uh, second position is just where our index finger is going to shift to where our second finger, our middle finger, is usually playing notes. Um, so I'm going to... The first thing that's happening is this shift where I'm sliding from my ring finger on the 5th fret to ring finger on the 7th fret so that then my uh, index finger can play the 3rd fret. But here's the whole thing. So, like I said, we have this slide happening, so ring finger on the 5th fret, slide up to the 7th fret, and it's written in kind of a bizarre way here, um, you'll see this if you look at other, like, transcriptions that I've done. There's two different ways to, there's two different ways to accent a slide, I think. Just have a regular, a full one and count slide. There's a difference between, like, playing the note and then immediately sliding into the next fret. So, like, the slide is kind of taking up that whole amount, that whole quarter note in most cases. One and one and where you just start sliding immediately but what's written here i essentially all it is is that you're starting on that first note in this case the fifth fret and sort of leaving it there for just a little bit longer before you start sliding 
And it's just, it's truly such a tiny difference, but it's the difference between... So here's uh, immediately sliding versus it's such a tiny difference, but it's one of those tiny differences that like can really have a big impact on the subtlety of your playing. So uh, we have this sort of slow slide and we're still using the pinky. Um, if like these, the notes seem sort of intimidating or anything. I know that it's kind of weird, but it's you're really playing exactly the same thing. You've just moved your hand up one fret, essentially. Um, all of the distances between your fingers stay the same. But now we're going... We're using the pinky to play this. What is that? An E-flat note, eighth fret of the D string. Not E-flat, B-flat, sorry. So a very... Uh, a G run. But we're going... So, 8, 3, and then 6, 5, 3, and then 7, 3. Let's play that together with the slide. It's The slide happens on and off, so uh, this technically starts on and off beat. It's kind of weird. For the sake of just like being able to play it and rehearse it right now, it, I'm just going to count. And we'll come in on one. So two, three, four. Good, one more time. Two, three, four. Yeah. So then the last little bit is. So that's fifth fret and two fifth frets on the D string. And then. Seven, five, seven, three. So all of that together is let's try that. And again, I'll just count almost coming on one. So two, three, four. Oops. Two, three, four. Again, two, three, four. Yeah. So um, let's look at the whole thing. We'll play it uh, together. We're going to play through it once real quick so we can sort of hear it. Uh, just remember, we, you know, it's a whole bunch of stuff. So remember, we're starting here in our first position. We do two-thirds melody, and then we kind of do this one long run-on sentence like at the end. But here's what it sounds like. That's mostly right. <laughs> a few little weird things here and there. Let's try to play it together a couple of times. So remember, this comes in on the second beat, so I'm going to count three, four, one, but I'm going to anticipate it. Because we're going so slow, I'm almost going to anticipate it by like a full eighth note. So it'd almost be like on the and of one, three, four, one. time a little bit quicker um, three four one
Great job. I hope that that was helpful, and I hope that you enjoyed working that tune up. It's a, it's kind of a, a tricky and kind of hard in, in ways that you wouldn't expect. So I hope it was fun, and if you have any requests for things that you want to learn next, uh, be sure to let me know in the comments. Let me know which one is your favorite uh, of the Bluegrass albums. I think that I like, I like the first one. I like California Connection. Is that the third one? I hope that you enjoyed the video and I hope that you'll like it. It's pretty easy to do is just hitting the like. If you really like it, you can subscribe because there'll be more videos coming out all the time. And if you really, really like it, it'd be helpful if you wanted to share this with anybody that you think might enjoy it or get something out of it. But in the meantime, I hope you have fun playing the mandolin and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.